Let me begin with uh, reading from the beginning, Genesis. First book in the Bible is the book of Genesis. I'll recap it for you. Genesis 1 and 2, first two chapters, creation. God creates everything out of nothing and proclaims it good. Very, very good. And then Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle or clever than any other of the wild creatures that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of all of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the, fruit of the tree which is in the center of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Basically, the devil responded to the woman, Surely you do not believe God. For God knows that if you partake of that forbidden fruit, you yourselves will become like gods, knowing good and evil. Well, we know what happened after that. Uh, Eve bit into the big lie, uh, the original sin. That's exactly where all the trouble began. God said to the serpent, the devil, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply, multiply your pain in childbearing, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. War. Enmity. From the beginning. From the very beginning, God said, I will put enmity. And the battle was on. This year, I celebrated my 10th anniversary of ordination to the priesthood. And throughout the course of this year, I've taken quite a bit of time to reflect uh, on the last 10 years on my life in general. Very thankful, of course, to be a priest. Very thankful. One of the things that I have to realize about myself, you know, we all have good points and bad points, I guess. Uh, I, I probably have more bad than good. But one of the things, for better or for worse, is that I really, I really can't fail to talk from the heart with you. Even if I wanted to, I can't do it. Uh, the Holy Spirit rather... Uh, not forces me, but gives me the grace, maybe, to talk as you might talk with a family member. I've preached all over the United States, Canada, several foreign countries. It's a very humbling thing. I don't know if you're aware of that. It's a very, very humbling thing to have to stand before the people of God and teach, preach, Preaching is a particular form of teaching. It's a, an apostolic form, a very ancient form. It's a charism. It's a gift, a special gift of the Holy Spirit given to an individual for the sake of the building up of the body of Christ, the church. And it is a humbling thing to do that. I began preaching, I guess you could say, with my own story. Uh, providentially, my home parish in Hudson, New York, uh, when I was ordained a deacon, was St. Mary's Parish. It was the only Catholic church in town. <laughs> there had been three, but two of them were closed. My parish that I'd grown up in was closed. And the um, administrator of the parish at the time was Father John Bertolucci, who was a rather famous preacher. And um, he started me preaching. I started to travel with him. And that was in... Oh, about 1990, when I was a deacon. 
it's funny how things change as you go along. Uh, he basically forced me to give my personal testimony. You know, it says in Scripture, in the pastoral letters of St. Paul, never be ashamed of giving your testimony. Everybody has a testimony. Never be ashamed of giving your testimony to the Lord. Uh, I rather think, in general, Protestants are much better at it than Catholics. They make a, a, a pretty good deal out of personal testimony, giving witness. Give glory to God for what he's done for you. Well, we don't like to talk about it too much. That's not our way. And that's kind of the way it was with me. Too. But old Father Bertolucci, he, he kind of brought it out. I mean, he said, you've got to do it. You've got to share and, and I'll never forget it. He shook his head and said, besides, no one ever had one like yours. <laughs> now, thank God. <laughs> Maybe you can tell certain things by titles. You know, the, the title that I've conceived for that personal testimony, I haven't given it in several months, by the way. I, I don't like it. It is my least favorite thing to do. I don't like talking about it. I don't like talking about my own experiences, um, although thousands and hundreds of thousands of people tell us that they've profited from it in one way or another. I don't like doing it, and I haven't done it for months. But now we've got to do it again, it seems. And if, <laughs> if you can tell anything by titles, you can kind of tell the evolution of a thing by the titles that uh, are conceived in relation to that thing. I remember when I began the title for that, my, my personal story that we came up with, and the darkness could not prevail. Now that's a, a nice um, kind of biblical catchy title, the darkness could not prevail. It's reminiscent of the prologue of the Gospel of John, right? Uh, and God said, let there be light. We know the darkness could not prevail over the light. Well, my life when I look back on it, it was kind of a battle between light and darkness, good and evil. And so that was a pretty good title when I started out, and the darkness could not prevail. Then time went on. Time has a way of humbling you. And I realized that it wasn't yet over. And so maybe the darkness could prevail. You know, we're not saved till we're in heaven. Contrary to what our good Protestant brothers and sisters talk about, are you saved, brother? I always tell them, I don't know, but when I get to heaven, I'll let you know. <laughs> you know, we're all redeemed. You know, we, we are, are recipients of the redemptive work of Christ. Saved? Well, when I get to heaven, that's when I'm saved. Until then, I work out my salvation in fear and trembling. And so I began to think, well... Hmm, the darkness is still battling with the light. And I'm caught right in the middle. And it's not over. And then I, I, I realized that, that my story is about mercy. It's about God's mercy. And I, right at the focal point of my conversion story was God's revelation to me that his very name is mercy. God's name is mercy. He, it really is. God is a merciful God. Now, many of us haven't yet gotten it right. A lot of us grew up in a time where justice might have been stressed a little too much. God is a just God, that's for sure. But mercy prevails over justice. And so for a long time, the title of my personal testimony was God's name is Mercy. And then in the last couple of months, the events of September 11th and following, of course, caused, probably caused all of us to take stock of a lot of things, right? To, uh, maybe we even went to confession. I did. Hey, I'll tell you what, I, I, I wasn't conscious of any enormous sins, but I felt a lot better walking out of the confessional. In the light of what was going, I wasn't taking any chances. Hey, I fly all the time. <laughs> right? I'm on airplanes most of my life. And in considering my life, an another title jumped up, Ground Zero. Ground Zero, that's what I feel like nowadays. I feel like my life story 
could be titled Ground Zero. From beginning to the present day, I feel like I was born into an era and time of conflict. I was born May 20th, 1947, right after World War II. I'm a classic baby boomer. My dad, like so many men and women, my, my mother was in the military too, you know. My mother was an officer. My dad wasn't even an officer. My mom was an officer. She would often remind him of that as well. <laughs> and pull rank. Didn't do her any good, though. And <laughs> my dad was Italian. <laughs> old, old time. Chauvinist type Italian. Conflict. It was a time of conflict. When I look back on just my family, you know, I think about my grandfather, my mother's dad, my maternal grandfather. Uh, he enlisted in the Army in World War I. He was a sergeant in the United States Army. World War II, my dad, his younger brother's Korea. 1967, I enlisted in the Army, Vietnam. Conflict. A time of conflict in the world. An atomic bomb, a couple of them, were dropped on cities in Japan. That's ground zero. And then, again, the term comes up in the last couple of months, right? Ground zero, the World Trade Center. And looking back on it, I can't help but think that I was caught most of my life in ground zero. What do I mean by that? Well, I think in explaining my life, it sums up a lot. I'm not that odd. An awful lot of people from my generation uh, kind of feel the same way and fall in the same category. We were subjected to the same pressures. Things were changing. There was a dynamism at work in those years immediately following World War II. Morals began to unravel in my own lifetime. Uh, I can think of the battle, the conflict, the enmity involved in the, the moral battle that took place in our country and in the world. When I was a boy, the United States was an extremely moral place. Now, you understand, I know, that when I say these things, I'm speaking in, in general terms. Obviously, there's always been sin. Uh, we've never had a perfect country. No one ever had a perfect country because countries are made up of human beings, and human beings are sinners. And so to a greater or lesser extent, every country is imperfect, but I believe that we had a tremendous country, moral country. I remember when I was a boy how wholesome, thinking back on it, you know, how wholesome the environment was in this country. We never worried about crime. I don't know about how it was up, up here back in the 50s, let's say. But where I grew up in upstate New York, you didn't have to lock your door back in the 50s. There was no such thing. We didn't have that. I know, uh, I knew a police officer who lived right across the street from us, old cop. He was a cop 40-some years. And he told me, he gave me a price. He retired from the police force, and he gave me a bullet. And I was a kid at the time, you know, and I was mightily impressed by um, Sergeant Pizarro gave me a bullet from his gun. He had carried the same six bullets in his service revolver for 45 years. <laughs> they looked old. <laughs> old 38 special bullets. They were corroded. <laughs> same bullets in the gun for all that time. He had never had to fire a shot. That tells you a little something about that period of time that led up, oh, I would say he retired around 1962 or so. Things began to change. I went into high school, 1961. Things began to ferment. It was a spirit of rebellion. It was the me generation. I got to be free. I got to be me. Meaning I want to do what I want to do. Morality? Ah. Eh. That's relative, the false philosopher said. Religion, well, that's good for grandma, mom. I got to go on Sunday, and did. I came from a household 
where mom was like, well, you could have given her the other, her other title, Sergeant First Class. <laughs> when mom said do it, you did it. God forbid if it had to go to dad. But I got to be, oh, probably 15. And do you know how it is when you're 15? Having acquired all possible knowledge, Thus, unable to be told anything for the simple reason that I already knew everything. I began to sneak off to the pool hall on Sunday morning. We had a rather notorious pool hall. I grew up in Hudson, New York. Now, I didn't know it until the last two weeks, but Hudson, New York was one of the most notorious towns on the East Coast. I grew up in that town. I was born there, grew up there, didn't know a thing about it. Why? The, the, the big gangsters, Legs Diamond and, and company, they used to all go there. Dutch Schultz, they used to go there. It was the center of prostitution in the known universe, at least on the East Coast. It was a bad place. I didn't know that until two weeks ago. <laughs> Honestly, a friend of mine sent me a book that somebody wrote a history of that, and, and uh, it, it, was, it was very very interesting. I recognized the names and the places. You know, it, it was quite interesting, but I never knew that growing up. But that period in history, it was different. I remember the forces that were at play. I suppose every generation has those forces pulling at them. We call it peer pressure, I think, nowadays. You know, the kids have terrible peer pressure. Uh, you feel like you're not with it if you don't do what everybody else does. And, uh, you know, my grandmother's wisdom, well, if they jump off Spook Rock Bridge, are you going too? <laughs> you know, really, that, that's, and we'd scoff at that, but it's true. Ground zero, right in the middle of it. From the age of <laughs> infancy on. It doesn't happen all at once, you know. I grew up in a good family, a Catholic family, went to church every Sunday until I got in my late teens, more or less. Had every opportunity, wasn't a bad kid, never got in trouble when I was young. Our culture forms us. The most powerful formative influence on an individual should be the family, mom and dad. Now, my mother and father exerted an influence upon me but I dare say that for a certain period of time, the world's influence was even greater. Moms and dads, beware. If you allow the world to form your children rather than you, do not be surprised at the outcome. For we live in a neo-pagan society with disvalues often having replaced authentic values. Don't abdicate your parental responsibilities in the name of being with it. You can blink your eyes and lose your children. Ground zero, the battle for a soul, and the battle is fierce. I remember from my earliest days being terribly fearful of something. I didn't know what. It wasn't until many, many years later and I came to understand spiritual things that I recognized a form of persecution that came straight from the evil one. We have a lot of talk about terrorism today. That is the topic of the day. But very few people know what real terror is, or where it comes from. The master terrorist is Satan, and I am not talking metaphorically. I am not speaking in the language of metaphor, I'm speaking literally. The master terrorist is Satan, the Bible says, and Satan and terror went before him. It's a palpable thing. It is a sense perceptible thing. I'll never forget, I once went to an old house 
in upstate New York when I was young. An abandoned house, a quote, haunted house. At a certain point, terror went through that house like a wind, and you couldn't even breathe. Years later, in the midst of assisting at an exorcism, I encountered the same thing again. And this time, it's reaction to the name of Jesus. Yes, the master terrorist is Satan. And that battle has been going on since the beginning. Since the angels fell, since darkness entered Eden. And the outcome of that battle is what determines the outcome of every other battle. I think everybody longs to be special. Everybody longs to be looked up to. I don't know about you, but when I was a boy, I wanted my parents to be proud of me. I wanted my friends to look up to me, but I was so shy that I couldn't possibly do anything toward that end. I don't know if any of you ever experienced this, but when I was a little boy, I was so painfully shy, frightened, I don't know, you could call it inferiority complex, any number of things. Uh, I wouldn't go to school. My mother literally had to drag me to school. Now, it, it almost sounds funny, but it wasn't, I assure you. It was terribly painful. I would sit in the classroom absolutely terrified that I would have to speak in front of the other children. Now, anyone who thinks God doesn't have a sense of humor, listen up. I remember being called on. It's not that I didn't know my lessons or was stupid or something. I was just afraid to open my mouth in front of other people. And it was a, a fear. It wasn't just a fear. It, it was an outright phobia, a terror. I couldn't do it. And that went on for years and years and years. But we all have a desire to be something special. Well, at first it took the form of sports for me. Now, you know, athletics is a good thing. When we were driving to Escanaba from the airport in Green Bay, when we came from the airport, the folks that picked me up showed me Lambeau Field. They knew I admired Coach Vince Lombardi and uh, showed me the field uh, just from the outside. Sports are good. Athletics are good. Competition is good. A lot of people don't think so. I, I really believe it is good. But you've got to remember something. It's not an end. It's a means to an end. It can teach you something. Uh, I remember one of the things. My, my dad was not a spiritual man. My dad, when he was young, was uh, maybe everything you shouldn't be. He was a gambler, a drinker, chased women, not your particularly wholesome, good dad. He was, a, he was a real good athlete. He was a boxer. And one of, the, one of the things he taught me was to never quit. For someone who is in a lifelong fight, that's a good lesson. I remember my father said, he didn't say it. He impressed it on me in the old way, the old-fashioned way. I grew up in the good old days. I'm just old enough. I'm not that old, but I'm just old enough to be able to say I grew up in a different time in history, the days before lawsuits, the days before children divorced their parents, you know, the days when, when uh, you know, your grandmother, if your saster might give you one of those, you know what those are? That's an Italian gesture. My father taught me to never quit. Die first. Die first. Don't ever. It's the only lesson that I ever remembered of all the things my father had said to me. It wasn't until the past two years that I came to really interiorize it and understand it as I watched him fight one illness, one infirmity after the other. 34 surgeries in five years. Don't you quit. Ground zero. My life when I look back on it, really does feel like a war. 
athletics began. I didn't go where I wanted to with that. It left me very disappointed. I was injured. Went in the military in the 60s. I aimed high. The Army says, be all you can be. I wanted to. I enlisted in 1967, Special Forces. Went through all the training. Was very proud to be attached to those units. My old unit was the first one in Afghanistan, by the way. That wasn't highly publicized. I knew they'd go. They were, they were specialized in mountain warfare, 10 Special Forces. Well, I couldn't do that either. Injured. Went to college. Graduated from college. It, nothing clicked. I was successful in everything that I did, but not happy in anything that I ever did. I finished almost everything I ever started. I got my honorable discharges and I got my college degrees, but I was empty. There was something missing. St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in thee. I will repeat that for those of you from 8 to 80 who have not yet interiorized that reality. Our hearts are restless until they rest in God. Our hearts are empty until they rest in God. Our hearts are broken very often until they rest in God. We want to be happy. That's the end of the human being. What is the object of human existence? Happiness. What does every human being desire? Happiness. But what is it? That's the problem. We don't know. And so we seek happiness in a thousand created. I sought it in sports to be successful. And then in business, in the military. One thing, one created thing after that left me empty, cold. Money. You know, the world says in order to be something, you've got to have some money. Got to have big bucks, right? If you don't have money, you can't do a lot of things. You can't have a lot of things. I grew up relatively poor. And so when the affluent generation of the baby boomers began to hold sway in the 60s and 70s. I was right there, on the crest of the wave, pursuing money. Caught up with it, too. Caught up with it in Beverly Hills and Hollywood. After several years working as an accountant, a real estate broker, I began to make a lot of money in Hollywood and Beverly Hills. Famous clients, rock stars, movie stars. I thought this would bring me happiness. I remember having, after having made a lot of money, I made my first really <clears throat> large real estate commission. And my accountant, you know, by then, even though I was an accountant, I had to hire accountants, because after you start making a lot of money, you know, you have to hire accountants to keep the money and lawyers to protect the money. So I had an accountant, and he said, you're making too much money. You have to have some tax shelter. And so I went out and bought a new Ferrari. A nice shiny red one. And I had mine before Magnum PI. And I remember driving it out of the dealership down Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. Now, Rodeo Drive is probably the most expensive piece of real estate in the world. The shops on Rodeo Drive, the wealthy people from all over the world that shop there, it is a, it's a very exclusive place. But when you drive a nice shiny red Ferrari down Rodeo, that even turns heads there. And I remember thinking that I had arrived, finally. I remember thinking, as I stopped at a red light there in Beverly Hills, and a group of good-looking, what we called valley girls, were poised on the street corner. They were very good-looking girls with very small brains. That's what the definition of valley girls in those days were, in case you don't know. Now, I didn't give them that definition, but that's what the general consensus was at that time. But I liked them quite a bit. And I remember being stopped there, and they started pointing and whispering. That's so-and-so, the movie star. Oh, no, that's so-and-so, the producer. Oh, no, oh, well, I know it must be somebody. And I remember it hit me right between the eyes, and I thought, that's right. Finally, I'm somebody. 
out of the smoke and fury of a life of fighting and clawing, out of that ground zero, finally, I've made it. Wrong again. Oh, it lasted for a few years. The successes, one after the other. You buy a car and then a bigger car. You get a house and then a bigger house. You get a boat and then a bigger boat. And so forth and so on. And each succeeding step leaves you colder and emptier. I remember one Monday morning after a weekend party at my house, all the jet set people had left and I was there alone in my 3,000 square foot bedroom, literally. That's bigger than the house I live in now, by the way. My bedroom was almost twice as big as my whole house right now. The house I live in now is about 1,600 square feet. But in any event, there I was. I sat there and I said, this is it. Man, I'm successful. I've made it. I've achieved the American dream. And I remember the emptiness that overtook me. It was terrible. Shortly after that, I ended up in a hospital. A VA psychiatric hospital, cocaine addict, physically destroyed, emotionally destroyed, spiritually desolate. The attack, it seemed, had me. I came as close to death as you can come, as far as I can tell. Three years of my life, I spent a year in that hospital, by the way, one full year, never had a visit. My mother came once. But I never had all the friends and groupies, the hangers-on. They abandon you like rats off a sinking ship. Such is temporal success and the loss thereof. I remember being released from the hospital and ending up homeless. Now, if you want to talk about ground zero, I can tell you about being homeless. I can tell you about not having any place to live, not knowing where your next meal would come from, having nothing but the clothes on your back. I can tell you about the night falling, the air growing colder, no shelter, no warm house. I went from being a multimillionaire to a homeless man. I thought many, many times that I would die in the streets of Los Angeles. I remember hiding in the park, going in the bushes and just trying to hide. No one would see me. No one could hurt me. Eventually, my mother brought me home. Everyone else can abandon you, but not mom. My mother had prayed the rosary over 20 years for me. Through all of the war and fury and enmity of my own life, through the fury and storm and fire of that ground zero, there had been a little woman in a little house in upstate New York with a rosary, praying. Day after day and week after week and year after year, 20 plus years, she never stopped. And a grandmother, and several pious aunts, and I would only learn of it later, but every one of them went to their death, having prayed the rosary every day, and I mean all day long. My grandmother, especially, and my Aunt Mary, 8, 10, 12 hours a day, sometimes longer. They had nothing else to do. They were in nursing home. I remember once my grandmother, the age of 94, when I visited her, her head came up and she looked around and she said, my goodness, look at all these old people. <laughs> she was 94, the oldest one in the joint. <laughs> but in the midst of that fury and moral and spiritual fight, I had people praying for me, my family. I have often thanked God for the gift of a good Catholic family. Now, most of you... Uh, are what I consider the cream of the crop. You're the pillars of the church. 
Uh, you're the people who care. You're the people who pray, who practice your faith. And many of you suffer because of your children and grandchildren. I know because I was one of the ones that caused that kind of suffering. I know all about it. Boy, I caused a lot of suffering, a lot of pain to my mother and my grandparents. And you also have similar sufferings. Now, I have very, very good news for you this evening. Probably you didn't expect to get this news. But I'm going to deliver it to you right here and right now. Remember the, the gospel this evening, or the, rather the first reading, talked about um, how blessed the feet of those who bring good news. I got new, good news for you. Your children and grandchildren have no chance of being lost. And don't you forget that. Because of your prayers. You say, well, how can you say that? I have absolute 100% confidence in the goodness of God and His Holy Mother. You keep praying. You pray the rosary, like my mother did for me. Well, I went home. One thing led to another. I went to confession. By the way, one of the talks this weekend I'm going to give is on how to make a good confession. Uh, now, for, for years, people have said, and I've done it in one form or another, but I never did one talk concise, simple, easy to follow, I hope, how to make a good confession. Now, that's required knowledge for every Catholic. Do you know how to make a good confession? Well, you better. Advent's coming, right? We go, we've got Advent this weekend. It's upon us. Advent means preparation. Uh, one of my talks is, you know how, remember when the president addressed the military and he said, get ready? Well, I'm addressing you. Get ready troops. Get ready. Advent literally means preparation. Advent is preparation for the coming of the Lord. Another one of my talks this weekend, tomorrow, will be Advent equals, get ready, prepare for the coming of the Lord. One of the ways you do that, make a good confession. Some of you might want to make a general confession. Uh, now, I made a general confession June 24th, 1984. I'll never forget it. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. 20 years since my last confession. Now, you may think that that takes a very, very long time. It took about five minutes. A whole lifetime of sin, there's only 10 commandments. You can't break any more than that. <laughs> so even if you've been away for a long time, it's not going to take that long, believe me. People come to me to confess all the time. They say, oh, Father, oh, uh, you know, it's been a long time, 30 years, 40 years. I, I, I don't think you have enough time to hear my confession. I said, oh, ho, ho. I never heard a confession that had to go more than 10 minutes, ever. You don't have to tell every single detail. Well, you're not supposed to, as a matter of fact. A lot of people feel they need to. But with God, you just go right through the, through the commandments. A little help, boom, there it is. You get rid of that burden. The first step to happiness, true happiness, is a good confession. And that takes a little humility. For years I didn't have it and couldn't do it. And so I was miserable. But then, with the help of the grace of God, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Boom, blink of an eye. The priest raised his hand. And the most beautiful words came out of his mouth. I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the chain. A few years later, seven to be exact, I found myself in St. Peter's Basilica, kneeling before the Pope with his hands on my head. He ordained me a priest. A few hours later, walking through the Basilica, a man from the shadows said, Father, would you hear my confession? I remember having the profound thought at the time, I can do that. <laughs> and he began, bless me, Father, for I have said it's 35 years since my last confession. And for the first time, I raised my hand and the beautiful words came out of my mouth. I absolve you from your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A couple years later, my dad 
came down to hear his son preach for the first time in Florida. Spent a couple days, had to leave. It was a Wednesday morning, and he said, Hey, you got a minute for your old man? I said, Well, sure, Dad. You want to have breakfast? He said, No, I want to go to confession. And I heard these words come out of my father's mouth. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It is 50 years since my last confession. And my dad made the most beautiful confession I've ever heard, on his knees, so reverently. And after I gave him absolution, he said, I've been in the dungeon a very long time, but now I'm free. Now I'm free. And then he began his life all over again. Oh, he was an aging man. Some would say an old man already. And I'll never forget, right after that, he said, I wish I could have been a better father. And God heard the prayer in heaven. And he sent him the most powerful gift that a good God could give to one of his beloved children. As Padre Pio used to say, Jesus gives the biggest share of his cross to his best friend. And my father entered into redemptive suffering. And it was his painful life in the last years that breathed supernatural life into my ministry. Oh, he wasn't the only one. I had a lot of help from a lot of people. But he was a big player. See, there is indeed a war that rages round about all of us. And although I say I feel like my life has been ground zero, many of you can say the same thing. Many of the young people can say it. Some not so young can say it. We feel like we've been through it. We've been scorched by the noonday sun. We've borne the heat of the day. Tough. And yet, if God is for you, who can be against you? And so we press on toward the finish line. I remember thinking after I gave my testimony first couple times, well, this is good. This is a good start to my preaching work. I have a story that I can share with the people. It seems to affect them. And I, I had the mistaken notion, I think, in the beginning that uh, you tell your conversion story and it's a kind of a static thing, kind of a constant thing. But that's not true. I find now, ten years later, it's very different. I look back on ten years of the priesthood that I add on to that first portion of my life. I was ordained at the age of 44. I'm now 54. The last 10 years qualify more for the term ground zero than all the rest of it put together. The last 10 years make the first 44 pale into utter insignificance when you compare the fury, the fire, and the strife involved. The priest is at the center of the storm. Why? For a very simple and logical reason. Strike the shepherd, scatter the sheep. The devil is a tactician. He's a strategist, an opportunist, and he will do anything he can to strike down a priest. Monday I have the great privilege and blessing to share some time with some of the priests from the Day of Recollection. It's a rare privilege. I don't get that privilege too often. I'm thankful for it whenever I do. I don't know if you understand what the life of a priest is. I know you have a rough life too. It's not easy being a parent. Once somebody asked me, hey, you ever wonder why God didn't let you get married and have a wife and children? I said, oh, I know why God didn't let me get married. Well, why is that? He didn't trust me enough. That's a rough job. Being a wife, a husband, parent. Man, today, that's a rough job. I couldn't handle it. But then again, you can do what you're given the grace to do. And so he gave me a different job, different vocation. But your priest, you need your priest. And we need you. We're in it together. This tremendous spiritual combat that we are faced with we are in this together. You remember, remember what happened immediately after September 11th? Unity. You remember out of that 
terrible tragedy came unity. The nation came together. There was strong leadership. Charity began to flourish again. There was a certain dignity restored to public officials. In a few short months, the presidency in the United States of America was so rotten and tarnished that you could scarcely look at it. It was a laughing stock around the world. And in the twinkling of a divine eye, change. Dignity was restored to public officials. On Monday, we were cursing all the politicians. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we were rather thankful for solid leadership. God can bring good out of evil. There is a war, a violent war, raging. And every one of us has a place. Every one of us has a place on the battle line. I know that this is going to go in one ear and out the other with some of you. But I'm going to have to tell you something now. I'm going to have to tell you it's, it's my unfortunate duty to have to tell you something, that if it goes in one ear and out the other, I will be at the gate of heaven to condemn you. When you try to get out by pleading ignorance, I'll be there to say, I told them. And don't you ever forget it, because I'm dead serious. From this moment forward, you have an obligation just like I have an obligation. My obligation is to tell you that you have an obligation. Now there, I've fulfilled my obligation. <laughs> now you got to do it. What's the it? It's called holiness of life. Jesus gave it to us. It's a mandate, a divine mandate. You must be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. You must be perfect, perfected. Another, I like the other translation. I think it's in Luke. You must be perfected as your Father in heaven is perfect. That gives me hope. I am not yet perfect. Far from it. Perfected. In other words, on the way. We haven't arrived yet. On the way. Take it seriously. Souls will end up in hell because of you and me if we don't take it seriously. I'll never forget an absolutely chilling story from the life of blessed Padre Pio. Many of you know who Padre Pio was. He, he was a, a Capuchin, Franciscan friar in Italy. During the time of World War II, he, he died in 1968, I believe it was. Beatified, he'll be canonized. Had the stigmata of our Lord. People used to go from all over the world to confession to him. And sometimes he had particular charisms, gifts. He could read people's souls. A woman went to him one time to go to confession. Didn't think much of it. She knelt down. He leaped up and chased her out of the church. She didn't say a word. He chased her out of the church. Later that afternoon, she came back. And she said, why did you treat me in that terrible manner? And he said, because the moment you knelt down, God showed me your three sons in hell. And they're there because of your permissive parenthood. That's why. Now, confess your sins. I hope that I will not have to stand before God and give an account of my negligence concerning you. I hope I will not have to stand before Almighty God and give an account how I let your soul slip through my fingers, how I didn't tell you the truth, how I watered it down, told you what you wanted to hear. I hope I never have to stand before a perfectly just, though perfectly merciful God with that on my soul. I remember a teacher in the seminary saying to us, a priest doesn't lose his soul usually because of what he does, rather because of what he fails to do. And I'm not going to hell for any of you. <laughs> so there. Tell it like it is, in other words. You know what's right, and you know what's wrong. 
I can't tell you anything you don't already know. You're pretty smart cookies. You know your faith. All I have to do is remind you of it and try to convince you that you can do it. I remember my old football coach. He convinced us that we could do the impossible. A lot of you think you can't be saints. I'm telling them you have to. You know who goes to heaven? Saints. Now, I don't mean you have to be canonized. That's not what I'm talking about. A saint is someone who is in a state of grace, who dies, goes ultimately to heaven, might pass through purgatory, that's okay, but you go to heaven. That's a saint, someone who lives in the beatific vision. You are called to it, anything less than that isn't sufficient. Do you know what you're called to? And are you willing to do it? The president said, get ready. I'm saying the same thing, get ready. Get ready for the fight of your life. For the times we live in are challenging times. And what's going to happen is, I promise you this, you know, I've already, I'm not a prophet. I'm just, I'm just an ordinary priest. I'm not a prophet. But every priest, every priest, shares in the priesthood of Jesus Christ, who is also a prophet and a king. And I tell you in that prophetic spirit of Christ, get ready, because the times that we live in are going to heat up. And what's going to happen in that crucible of trial and tribulation is souls are going to be impelled toward the church and conversion. They will come in through you. Get ready. Get ready through holiness. Start to pray. Pray the rosary every day. The Holy Father, since September 11th, has told the whole church, every person, you must pray the rosary every day. Pray the rosary. That is the only way there will be conversion. I totally support our wonderful president. But I'm going to tell you something that I learned in 1968 when I sat in the first anti-terrorism class the United States Army ever had. You cannot prevent terrorism, so forget it. It's only a matter of time for the next incident. You can minimize it, you can do your best, but you cannot prevent it. And so, what you have to do is you have to turn to God, the only one who can solve the problem. Pray the rosary every single day, but if you're not in a state of grace, your prayers aren't very powerful. You must repent. Believe in the gospel. And let me tell you who needs to repent the most. A lot of us think that the drug addicts, the prostitutes, the thieves, and the murderers, and you're right, they need to repent. They do. But you know who needs to repent? The self-righteous. And the church is full of them. Examine your conscience. And make sure that you don't fall into the category of the Pharisee from that parable our Lord ta taught of the Pharisee and the publican. You know, the Pharisees are, oh, I'm a good man. I fast and I tithe. I'm glad I'm not like other men, sinners that they are. I have run into that constantly in the Catholic Church. Other churches, too. But in the Catholic Church, a great many people are very self-righteous. If you are guilty of that sin, get rid of it fast. There will be priests hearing confessions this weekend. Since I got up at 1 o'clock in the morning yesterday to travel, I might not do that tonight. So wear them out. <laughs> but you don't have to do it all tonight. Come tomorrow, and I'll help out tomorrow. It's a great blessing. My brothers and sisters, if your sins be as scarlet, they can be made whiter than snow, washed in the blood of the Lamb. I remember <laughs> preaching in a federal penitentiary one time, telling my story. And when I finished it, a great, and these were all lifers, by the way, murderers, rough, rough men. Big guy came right down the center aisle, came towards me. Six, five, six, six, 300 pounds easy. Came up to me, wasn't smiling. He came, got up to him and he sh held out his hand. 
shaking his head. Father, if God can forgive you, I know he can forgive me. <laughs> Amen, brother. Don't you forget it. God is a God of mercy. Yes, it's true that there's a lot of darkness and a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a big war swirling around us. And that war is mainly a moral and spiritual war. But I promise you something, if you'll work at it, if you'll fight the good fight and run this race right to the finish line, you are going to win. You have God on your side. And if God is for you, who can be against you? And at the end, when the dust settles and the smoke of battle is blown away, you'll stand before that good God and you will hear these beautiful words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master's.